Hello and welcome to the Sandeep Roy Show on Express Audio. The Sandeep Roy Show. Post the Section 377 verdict, India has embraced Pride Month with great enthusiasm. You can't miss the rainbow stickers, corporate diversity events, pride parties. But for LGBTQ people, pride doesn't begin and end with June. Some have been leading out and proud lives long before pride became cool. Poet Hoshang Merchant was born in 1947 and led a life that's hopscotched around the world from Mumbai to Los Angeles, from Heidelberg to Jerusalem. He edited the first anthology of gay writing from South Asia, Yarana, in 1999. His autobiographical fiction is called The Man Who Would Be Queen, and he's never been known to bite his tongue about love, life, and any sacred cows that might cross his path. This week, he joins us from Shillong, and because you can't keep him still, sometimes he gets up and walks around while talking. So just sit back and enjoy Hoshang Merchant, unplugged and indiscreet as only the man who is queen can be. This episode contains the use of explicit language and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Hoshang Merchant, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. This is Pride Month, and I remember in your autobiographical fiction, The Man Who Would Be Queen, you quoted the writer Octavio Paz as saying the gay movement, the women's movement are political. They have nothing to do with the reinvention of love. When did you start feeling that? I have always read Rambo, and Rambo wants to reinvent love. Rambo was the first gay writer in modern poetry in France. And he said, love has to be reinvented. And after reading Anais Neen, I added the addendum, sacrifice has to be learned. Love is sacrifice. Love is not sex. I invented love by loving everybody in new ways. I have loved bisexual men. I have loved married men. I have loved the very poor. I have loved drug addicts. And currently, I'm married to a bisexual who's married to a woman, and he's committed to me. I'm 75 years old. I might die any time. He will bury me. That is love. That is commitment. And I stand by him, his family. He comes every two months to meet me and spends 15 days with me. How did you meet each other? He was a student in the school, but I'm not in the school for the last 12 years. He was a student in the school three years ago. He helped me during the COVID year and then he wanted help to set himself up and I set him up and now he has a family in the Punjab. Even as a young person, were you thinking that you were consciously trying to reinvent love? Yes, absolutely. Because I had everything except love. And so where does that place you in the debate around same-sex marriage that's going on right now? No, no, I don't believe in it. It is heteronormative. Homo normativity, I don't believe in it. Homosexuals have to have their own culture. They're not to be ramrodded into heterosexual culture with marriage and children by surrogacy. What madness? What stupidity? People will say everyone should have the right to choose what they want. They have the right. Why should I believe in their rights? I believe in my right to love in my way. I believe in a homosexual culture which is not to be absorbed by the heterosexuals. This is nothing but to have babies by surrogacy to serve consumerism. It has nothing to do with love. It's commerce. So do you think there is a danger of be careful what you wish for, that in mainstreaming the LGBTQ movement? Exactly, exactly. People are too lazy. They cannot invent a pattern. They follow heterosexual patterns, which don't fit us. This top and bottom is a heterosexual pattern. They can't think because they're too lazy. But when you were a child, did you not want to follow the heterosexual pattern, fairy tale wedding? Of course I had to. I was 10 years old and 40-year-old men were imposing themselves on me. What do you think? I was born a messiah. Do you remember your first attraction to a man? Yes, I was 8 years old. And what happened? Nothing. He was my neighbor. Was he aware of your attraction? 
No, these unmarried Parsi gentlemen, they're all homoerotic and they don't know it. Or they don't want to know it. <laughs> and so when did you first learn about being gay? That this is a culture that exists, gay culture? Well, I was seduced when I was in the sixth standard, which may be 11 years old, by a 40-year-old neighbor whom I never saw again. And I read in the Coronet magazine when I was in the 10th standard, I must have been 15, about the Matashin Society. The Matashin Society was one of the early liberation leftist movements, but they were asking for tolerance. They were not asking for emancipation. Right. So I went to America looking for the Matashin Society in 1968. And they had already disintegrated. So where and when were you in America? I was in Los Angeles. I was in a very heteronormative college. And all we did was the baths and the saunas, you know. There was no liberation. And then I went to, from the frying pan into the fire, I went to Indiana. And we were all underground, literally underground, in the basement of the student union. We made a society... And then we even got an office. But then the other wave of the 80s came with the heteronormative, uh, homonormativity. And nobody wanted to come out and say they were gay. So we lost our office. We lost our status as a body in the student union. Did Stonewall and what had happened there affect you as at all? Was that exciting for you when you heard about Stonewall? No, I was a conservative man. Come on. I mean, I was miles away from New York. I wanted to be in New York, but there was no way I could be in New York. My last day in America, I spent walking around Greenwich Village and meeting all the artists. And I forgot to take my visa to Israel, where I was going. That's how savvy I was. Tell us a bit about what it was like at that time to live in small town America. Oh, I was beaten up. I was beaten up. And I was treated not like a victim, but like a victimizer. How so? What happened? Well, I cruised the streets and I got a sissy beater who beat me black and blue and left me on the streets to die. That's ironic because many people, many gay men of a certain generation wanted to leave India for places like America because they thought of it as a refuge. Well, they didn't know anything about America. A small term in America is more hateful than the Bombay I grew up in. In Bombay, everybody was bisexual. They had no guilt. America is guilt-ridden, homophobic. Why do you think that is? Why do you think a place like Bombay had less guilt than a place like America? Because we are Hindus. Ours is a shame culture, hence the secrecy. This coming out has no meaning in India. We are a shame culture. That's a guilt culture. Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism. These are guilt cultures. Where it's a sin to be gay. It's not a sin to be gay in Hinduism. It's just a variant sexuality of Shiva. But others must not know because of this colonial influence of colonial education. The family should not be shamed. You should not be shamed. Do it secretly. Do it. But do it secretly. There is no guilt. Is that what your family thought? My family was so uh, uninterested in their own children. They couldn't care less if I lived or died. They were busy settling scores with each other. They were getting divorced for 14 long years. They did not want to divorce. That was their raison d'etre. You don't want to talk about these psychotic people, please. I had to undo the after effects of my family. I had to undo the after effects of America. I wrote 30 books over 30 years. Do you think that at the end of 30 books you undid it or do you think it's still undoing? Or was it your undoing? Well, there are new challenges. Bisexual wanting to be my husband with a woman and a baby. I roll with the punches. I mean, I'm 75. What do I want from life? I just want a decent burial. <laughs> I've done everything myself. I can't walk to my own funeral, can I? I'm sure you can do anything you want, Hoshan. You will have to talk loudly. I'm deaf in one year. I said, I'm sure you can do anything you want. I can quite see you walking to your own funeral if you wanted to. I wish that was true. Now, one of the things when you say it's a shame culture, you've talked about as a young person, you know, you've talked about cruising in, in the trains of Bombay and stuff. And uh, like as a young person, do you think you use that shame culture that as long as we do it secretly, it's OK to your benefit also? 
Of course, what else could I do? I mean, I took the culture that was around me. I was 10 years old. What did you expect me to do between the ages of 10 and 15? I had a relationship when I was in college. But before that, how did you become aware of how you could? Well, I used to have a new man on the train every day. And then once a week, I'd go off with the man to have sex at his place or on the seashore. But I would never stick with anybody until I came to Interarts. And then there was a man and I had a relationship with him. But then I went abroad and I lost touch with him. When I came back after seven years, he was married and his wife wouldn't permit him to have a relationship even for three months. We parted as friends. A whole book, I had written a whole book on this. Bombay, my Bombay. Like when you were on these trains, how did you become aware that this was a place where you could pick up? No, no, I was seduced once. Once I knew what was happening, I became the seducer. I was touching other people. They didn't initiate it. I initiated it. And I was 12 or 14 years old at that time. How did you know who you that you wouldn't get beaten up for touching somebody? Everybody was gay. I got rejected twice in uh, five years of school and four years of college. You can make two mistakes in 10 years, can't you? You're absolutely allowed to. My gaydar was always working. Everybody's gay. Bombay is a hungry, lonely place. Now it's all Tinder and Grindr. So they don't know how to pick up a person for a date. They don't know what to stalk. Yeah, they can only type. And they lie, they cheat. There is no commitment. It's too easy. See, my professor at, in America said, look, Hoshan, we are after efficiency. All our gadgets are for efficiency. But there are certain aspects of life where you can't have efficiency. Love is one of them. You cannot be efficient in love. You have to invest time, energy and effort. So if you go to Grindr and all that, it's just a dead game. Love is not efficient. Sex may be. And when you were in America, though, were there already curry queens? Were you regarded as exotic and exciting also? Exotic, but exotic was a dirty word, no? That was a racist word. Like the brown heroines of Hollywood were exotic. Like Merle Oberon pretending to be white. Ah, and all those black girls who passed for white. Dorothy Dandridge and you name them. But were there curry queens already? People who had a fetish for people like you? I don't know about fetishes because I said, look, I am going to play the field. I want to sleep with a man of every nationality. I'm not going to have a type. I'm going to sleep with all types. I want all men. If I'm going to be gay, I'm going to be gay with everybody. Why would I have a type? So which country do you think has the most handsome men? Well, I think Japanese. The Japanese, really? I think or Chinese. But, of course, Chinese are different races, no? The Chinaman I slept with is, his lover said, this is not Shogun, this is not Shogun. He's Chinese. Oh, but he was so beautiful. So tell me about the first time you fell in love, though. The first time I fell in love. You know, I wouldn't fall in love because it hurt too much, because I felt betrayed by my mother. And I would, I'd fell in love at, at school, in the SSC, with a boy. And I even tried committing suicide for him. And he died at 36. So we were friends at 16. And then I came back and he was dead at 36. I never saw him again. And I was just playing the field and getting hurt. I would fall in love in the gay johns. Unless I loved that person I was having sex with, I couldn't get it up. And the other queen said, Hoshan, you're mad. You can't fall in love with every man you trick with. Become real. So I went to my teacher and my teacher said, why don't you love one person? I said, it's hurts too much. He said, of course it hurts too much. That hurt makes you human. And I fell in love with a complete neurotic madcap. But I found many good friends and they said they wouldn't sleep with me. And I said, no, sex or nothing. And I lost so many good people. But, well, I learned. See, some people learn by not having. I learned by not having. I think the great, great saints learned by not having. And where did you learn about gay friendship? Gay friendship? Well, it was thrust on me, no? Uh, not everybody's type. Are you saying friendship is what you get if you decide not to have sex? I think so, yes. But I'm having a friendship. So I have separated. My teacher taught me schizophrenia is hell. You can't get everything from one person. So 
get sex from somebody who gives you good sex, if there is a good man who wants to stay with you, but he doesn't give you good sex, keep him, don't kick him out. And that is what I'm doing. So I have three loves now. I have a sexual love, I have a non-sexual commitment, and I have a fantasy love on the internet. Fantasies are harmless. Fantasies are always free, but how do you keep this, all this straight? Forgive the expression. I keep them straight because I'm a very straight person. I have nothing else to do. This is my full-time profession, honey. I'm retired, you know. I'm a teacher. I teach people. Whoever touches me never goes empty-handed. If I know a person for three days, I teach him things. I'm a born teacher. I'm a lover in the true sense of the word. And all this... And who taught you? Life taught me. America put sex equal to love. When you take out that sex equation, you will get anything you want, including and beyond sex. Nothing is for free. There is a price for everything, right? If you're going to pay the psychological price, if you're going to pay the social price. When did you realize that? I realized it at 75. I've been married for three years. I could have gotten married when I was 27. Why did I wait till 72? Do you think you would have been happy to be married at 27? Though? Not at all. <laughs> I want my freedom. You think I could have seen the world? You think I could have taught a thousand people on three continents? You think that I could have immersed myself in two cultures? You think I could have invented this uh, gay literature in India if I was married with kids by surrogacy? Do you think, though, a person happy in love can produce great art? No, 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 no. My sister was wiser than me. I said, sister, why don't you write poems? Because she says, I'm not unhappy in love like you. <laughs> That's a terrible choice we are faced with. Well... You have to, you have, that is the choice. I read recently that that lady who wrote the Golden Notebooks. Yes. She has abandoned a daughter. Now that is a monstrous thing to do in Indian culture. She is a Nobel Prize winner, Doris Lessing. And she knew Sufism, huh? Mm -hmm. She was a Sufi. She was brought up in, uh, in Iran. Her father was in the diplomatic service in the 40s in Iran. So all these are hard won things, hard learned things. We don't want 377. We want to mainstream things. But at the same time, we also know that forbidden fruit does taste sweeter. No, no, but all that will go. You know, I was thinking about this. I'm writing in a pre-freedom era. My books will not last because my books are railing against 377. Once 377 goes, then heterosexual and homosexual will be the same. But that doesn't mean homonormativity. It means the homo should be allowed to live as homos, have their own culture, evolve their own selves, evolve their own love pattern. This is all market that's calling the Jew. Rajrav has gone so far as to say that 377 should stay. Is he mad? But at the same time, when you go to places like San Francisco, and it felt like a place like the Castro, which was the hub of gay culture, is now so sort of, heterosexual that the gay parents are complaining about window displays that they think might offend their children. When you were talking about gays mimicking heteronormative patterns, these are gay people, okay. gay people, gay couples who don't want to see naked mannequin Tom of Finland figure in the window of a shop or a sex shop in the Castro because now, you know, now they're parents with children and they think their children should be protected from these things. I see. How are you going to protect a child from the culture he grows up in? It's a sick society. Look at the opioid crisis. They have killed their own children just to make money for the pharmaceutical companies. They are taking my students who are dunderheads because they don't have children to run the computers. So were you glad to leave America? I was very glad to leave America. My God helped me. I was one step ahead of the gay AIDS crisis. I would have died of AIDS. I would have produced nothing. But when you went to America and you found bars and saunas and bathhouses, that didn't feel exciting to you? Oh, I was living in the baths. I was in the baths three times a week. My lover was happy to drive me there because I, I would drive and batty with demand of sex every night. Once I tricked him in the dark of the orgy room, he slapped me. <laughs> And the orgy room laughed. <laughs> you want more salacious stories? Please. Yes. Please, of course. Yes. At the baths, would people ask you, where are you from? No, no, no words were exchanged. I was an orgy room queen. I was only interested in dicks and kisses. Faces didn't matter. I think it was a 
painless choice. <laughs> the pain accumulated when I wanted faces to the dicks. What's the thing behind the dick called? It's called a man. <laughs> had come to that point, then I had to relearn everything. That so-called freedom of America is actually a trap. It's a prison. And at the same time, as you're exploring all of this, were you looking at literature to figure out who you were? Of course I was. Literature saved my life. Without literature, I would have been in the madhouse. Writing saved my life. You think it was easy in India, trying to love a human being who was a drug addict, who was a brothel goer? who finally committed suicide at 28 and I had to answer his parents, who were the cause of it all. Why don't they accept their gay children? Why do they have to go to the brothels to prove their masculinity? And then after America, you were all over the Middle East, in Iran, yes. Palestine. Yes. and Yes, because I wanted Arab men, I wanted Middle Eastern men. That was my fetish for a while. But I got Sufism, I got a whole culture of hospitality. I got a whole culture of benevolence of Islam. I don't know what these terrorists are talking about. That's not the Islam I know. I wouldn't be a human being without Islam. My Muslim friends made me a human being. I've become an animal, an American sex machine in the name of freedom and liberation. Was the relationship to the body very different in those cultures? In, because they're so much more homosocial cultures. The body is a fallen thing, no? Mm -hmm. In Zoroastrianism also, the body is a fallen thing. Right. It's not a fallen thing in Hinduism. The Kama Sutra is a spiritual test. It's about spiritual fulfillment with your legally wedded wife or with a courtesan who is legally empowered to be one and to attain uh, moksha through uh, karma. It's one of the ways to God. Look at the dancers, the Devdasis doing Odissi and Bharatnatyam and Sadar, actually, the, our Kathak dances also. And when you were living in the Middle East, in places like Iran, did most people around you know you were gay? Everybody knew I was gay. Those who had brains pitied me. Those who didn't have brains ostracized me. Those who were cunning tried to use me. I'm lucky to be alive. They would have shot me. What's the most danger you got into? Oh dear, I was once coming out of a man's room and I was caught by the committee, which is the morals committee. And I said I was a teacher, I said I was a Zoroastrian, you know, and everybody's ancestor was Zoroastrian. Run. They let me go, they are kind people. They could have taken me and shot me. That's the next day I left. I'm lucky to tell my tale. I'm a cat with nine lives. I think I'm on my ninth <laughs> one now. After having traveled so much around the world in so many different countries, why did you want to come back to India? Because that was the only place that will have me. Because gay marriages were not uh, allowed when I was in Europe. If gay marriage was allowed, I would have married and divorced. I didn't have money. I have money now, but I'm too old. I don't want to go anywhere now. I'm happy where I am. A known devil is better than an unknown one. Which year did you come back to India? I came back in 76, then I went away and came back in 86, 84, got my first job in 86. At that time, you've had all this experience around the world and all of that. At that time, coming back to... You think they cared? They wouldn't give me a job. I was lucky to get a job. I was wondering what it felt like to be gay in India at that time when you came back. Oh, people gossiped and people were malicious. They still are. Did you feel like India had changed in the time that you, had, you were gone? Well, I was out, so I had changed. Now India has changed. Now there are these new people, you know. But they live in Never Never Land. There is a Kerala Muslim boy from a small village who is now in Bangalore and is talking about gay marriage with a Rajasthani boy in Germany and having children by surrogacy. I mean, are they real? And just now he's been called home to look at women to get married to. And he doesn't have the guts to come out and say, I will leave you and I'll leave everything for my lover. It's going to be very tragic. I can't help people who don't want to help themselves. It's going to get worse. If you try to ride two horses, heterosexual and homosexual, where would you be? My lover is just lucky that I tolerate him. 
But perhaps that's the reason why you need same-sex marriage. When If it becomes truly normalized, then your Muslim friend from Kerala, his parents will say, Acha, marry somebody or the other, whether it's a boy or a girl, we don't care. Yeah, but that will take another hundred years, dear. It took them 70 years to repeal 377, don't forget. This is India. We are in slow motion. And when you started working in India, what was it like to be in academic circles to be gay? Well, they are educated people, no? Mm -hmm. I was the top of the crop in my subject. I had the support of other teachers, I had the support of other students. I was protected, I was lucky. I still go and touch the feet of my uh, first boss every time in Madras. These are educated people. These are Brahmins with good culture. These are not bigoted Brahmins. People often talk about, and you've written in, in your work also, that, you know, that people talk about your eccentricities. Do you think eccentricity was also an armor for you? Of course it is. Nobody is born eccentric. Queens are not born. Queens are made by being beaten up, by being thrown in a ditch, by being used in bed, outside bed, socially, sexually, financially. Then you know how to hit back how to save your skin. When people are coming out and to themselves, when they're realizing that about gay love, it is a solitary secret thing. But were you looking to find others like you? Were you looking for community? No, never. I'm a loner. I can't create 30 books in community. Writing is a lonely profession. You have to be alone. You can't create in... I mean, the Quran says, do not look into the womb. Mm-hmm. Because that fermentation takes place in secrecy for nine months. You can't get the word of God without it being fermented in your heart or wherever it is it's going to be fermented. These gestation metaphors are real metaphors. They are just not metaphors, you know. These are real experiences put into language. You have to go to the desert for 40 days to invent a new religion. You have to travel 40 days and 40 nights to heaven to come back with the holy book from heaven. 40 days could become 40 years, as they did in my case. But I found acceptance, no? The fact you're talking to me is acceptance, isn't it? It is. You wouldn't have talked to me 40 years ago when I was a mad queen. <laughs> I would have been terrified of you, probably. You still are, I think. I'm sure. I'm sure I am. I think. And you like that, don't you? Oh, yes. Good. Gives me yes. a sense of power. My father used to use a vulgar Parsi phrase. The hen has grown a cock. That's eccentricity is both an armor and a weapon. Would you want me to be beaten to pulp and thrown into a ditch again? Absolutely not. I wouldn't either. And <laughs> I couldn't survive at 75 <laughs> to tell the tale. You know, when you wrote that line, as everyone knows by now, I'm homosexual, to write this sentence and speak it publicly was a great liberation, which is why I write. Do you remember the context and when you wrote that? They asked me to write a blurb yeah. for the man who would be queen. So I wrote it as a blurb. Because nobody would write a blurb for me. Nobody respectable would write a blurb for me. Really? Even though by then you're a well-established poet and all of that? Because this was a prose about my sexual exploits. You know, the man who would be queen. People keep on saying, oh, you're such a great teacher. Why didn't you write about your teaching? I said, I still don't know why I'm a great teacher. I'm a great teacher. I finally found out last month because I inspire. A bad teacher tells you what to think. A good teacher teaches you how to think. But a great teacher inspires you how to live your life. In that sense, I was a great teacher, but I was a bad teacher. I didn't care whether they lived or died, passed or failed. I had to write my books, honey. I was a writer who couldn't live through writing, so I was teaching. Prostitute in the academy. Everybody is a prostitute in every teacher. We use this word gay liberation so glibly all the time now. And I was curious whether its meaning has changed for you. No, it, initially it meant the freedom to fuck in my own house. As I say in my interview with Project Bolo interview, the right to fuck in my house is my birthright and I shall have it. I'm the female pillar. But once you get that right, what does liberation, what will liberation mean? Ah, then you start becoming human. You start... Suffering and sacrificing to learn love. Otherwise, it's meaningless. Sex without love is meaningless. Sex without human commitment is meaningless. See, it's all vanity. You have to extinguish the ego. Yeah, with vanity, I've always wondered, you know, what do we really want? Do we want to be loved or do we want to be desired? 
Well, I think we want to be loved, but the way to be loved is to love first. And to love means not to want things for yourself, but to want things for the other person. That's hard. That is hard, and I'm a pansy. I'm a pansy. <laughs> I get, I'm a pushover. I take, get taken for a ride. So then I change my trains, and I go for another ride, hoping it will be less bumpy. But it's not. Who knew love? So what have you learned about love? I've learned about love that you can't win, and to let other people win, and to accept what comes, and to be a little less masochistic. Stand up for your right. Love doesn't mean to be a pushover. Which year did you edit Yarana? 1999. At that time, how difficult was it to find writing? Was it difficult to find uh, the material? Very difficult. And when we found the writing, they wouldn't let it get published or translated. So what did you do in terms of trying to get it all together? Well, it was not a, it was a re- little raggedy book, you know. And then the 10th edition... I got more stories. Right. Now that original edition is out of print. They are selling it in a black book like a sex manual or something for 4,000 <laughs> rupees. And I get nothing. What are some of the examples of things you found but you were not able to include in that anthology? In Orissa, Orissa is a very gay society, very repressed. In Odisha, they went to the man, they beat him up. They went into his house, they took his last handwritten manuscript and burnt it. Wow. You've also lost manuscripts. I remember you've written that your manuscripts were destroyed by ex-lovers or other people. Yes, other people. People who are jealous, people who are are stupid. What is left is in the archives, no? Cornell. I mean, I can't walk around the world with an archive on my back (laughs) like here in Song. What is it like for you when, you know, compared to the time when you're trying to edit Yarana and find something, uh, material... And you look at it. Oh, no, now people are coming to me, looking for things from me. I mean, when 377 occurred, they wanted a middle from me in the Hindustan Times. And what did that make you feel? No, well, I don't know. Times have changed and I've contributed to the change. That's all I feel. I didn't do it single-handedly. Yeah, times have changed. I contributed to the change. It makes me feel good. I'm not paid anything. So do you think now is the time we will have more happy gay stories a friend asked me when will we have gay stories more gay stories with happy endings well they will come they will come look at the literature of the west and look at our literature it comes from the society also but we have to make the society art doesn't imitate life life doesn't imitate art art has to tell life Mm. to imitate art art comes first and then life imitates art art doesn't imitate life if we set a high standard of living and writing in our literature and the people to follow the limited that literature. Right. We didn't have standards. We didn't have models. We were the first people. We became models willingly because of our courage. Does that alarm you to be put on a pedestal as a model? No, I tell them people come here, you're a famous person. I said, please knock it off. I greet people in my lungi and my banyan. Let them know what fame has done to me or for me. But sometimes I feel, Hoshang, the more artists come out, the worse their films, books, creative output becomes. That is true. They get sucked up in the, in the celebrity culture, you know. That celebrity is nonsense. Look at what has happened to Arundhati Rao. Look at what's happened to Vikram Singh. Now, in this culture, everyone fears aging and gaze Probably more so. Were you afraid of aging? No, no. I love old age. See, if I was in America, I would be on the dustbin. But here, the teachers are revered. Age is wisdom. Age is respected. I take advantage of this respect for old age. I get away with all kinds of murder being old. Like what? Like what? I have young lovers and nobody dares to anything to me. Are you good guy? Is <laughs> called Tane Hai Janelo. They don't know that there are other ways of loving besides penetration. Well, that's true because you also have to deal with desire now in a society which doesn't expect older people to have desire, right? That is true. Well, that is all worship. I have written essays for DNA. Do the old need sex? The simple answer is yes. That's how it begins. When you're talking about desire and aging... 
even popular culture also wants to put you in the box where you get to be the cute, even if slightly naughty, grandfatherly figure, which is cute, naughty, but ultimately sexless. Well, these children, this Jerry said that uh, you are naughtier than your writing even. I didn't expect you to be so naughty. So you found age liberating, actually. Yes, it allows you to do many things under your white wig. Your hair has been white for a long time. So you... you, you be- yes, <laughs> that's blonde. That's not white. I'm a blondie. That's what my Middle Easterner told me. No, no, you blonde. You don't have blonde hair. For a long time, as you said, the heart has no hair. The heart has no white hair. Your great hero, Anais Nin, I think she said, may it all be a beautiful adventure. Has it been? Yes, yes. It's not beautiful. You can't say beautiful. But it sure has been a misadventure after a misadventure until I started learning to protect myself against misadventure. I mean, I've, I've lived so many lives, Sandeep. I've not lived one life. I lived life as a prostitute, I lived life as a wise man, I lived life as a lover, I lived even life as a beautiful son and a beautiful brother. I tried to do best by neurotic women in my family, and you just couldn't win. If they are mad, they are mad. They want you to be mad with them. I'm sorry. And my other madness to take care of them. My divine madness. Prostitution leads to sainthood, doesn't it? What would you be the patron saint of? Patron saint of? Patron saint of misled children. Now I'm in this big trip. Mother Teresa, the gay child. My family, most of my fans are women and lesbians and then gay men because the gay men don't read. There is only one worse thing than burning books. It's not reading them. Maybe you should be the patron saint for reading. For reading? Yes. Well, writing is easy enough. Any, you can write, but to get people to read what you write, that's always the bigger challenge. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you get the people into the bookstores? I don't know how you can make people read what you write any more than you can make people love you. But we keep trying nonetheless. Hushang Merchant, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hushang Merchant is an acclaimed poet the author of multiple books of poetry like Bellagio Blues, Talking to the Jinns, and prose like The Man Who Would Be Queen, and one of the earliest voices in gay liberation in India. Send us your thoughts about this show wherever you get your podcast from. We are proud to have you as listeners. Find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Express Podcasts. Thanks for listening. This show was produced by Shashank Bhargav, and edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. This is Sandeep Roy on Express Audio.